Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Fish, Fisheries, and Carbon workshop. Um, this this uh, workshop is supported by the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Program. Um, it's I'll, I'll go into kind of the format of, of the workshop. Today is day one. Um, but first, I just want to, want to thank our, our co-conveners, which I'll introduce in a minute, as well as the OCB program office. So thank you guys for getting this going. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. There's been a lot of progress in this realm. Uh, a lot of, you know, it's really been ramping up in terms of people wanting to know about fish and fish carbon. Um, so we're happy that we're here. We're going to learn a lot. I know we're going to learn a lot as co-conveners this week as well. Uh, let's see. There we go. All right. So today is session one. Um, we're focused primarily on fish contribution to carbon flux. Um, today is uh, we're going to be co-convened by myself, Grace Saba. Um, I am a, an associate professor at Rutgers University. I um, am an organismal ecologist and physiologist, primarily focused on zooplankton and fishes. Um, I'm interested in how they respond to their environment, primarily um, things like ocean warming, ocean acidification, but I'm also very interested in their role in ocean biogeochemistry, primarily carbon flux. So that's um, my emphasis in, in learning more about fish and their contribution to carbon flux. Um, I'm co-convening today with my PhD student, Lauren Cook, who I will uh, introduce a little bit later as they are going to be um, introducing the other plenary speakers today as well. Um, session two is going to be held on Wednesday. That is going to be focused on fishery impacts on carbon sinks, and that's going to be co-convened by Emma Kavan and Simeon Hill. And then on Thursday, we have a, a session focused on societal impacts when managing fish stocks to protect carbon. And that's gonna be co-convened by Rashid Sumelia and uh, Rebecca Hubbard. So we hope you can join all of them. Um, I think I have a, a link in just a minute of where to go to register for those if you haven't already. Um, but one more time, I just want to uh, thank our workshop support, Heather, Ben Wei, uh, May Mahigan, and Mary Zawaski at the OCB program office for helping us get this going. Um, really, really appreciate your time and efforts there. Okay, so what are our workshop aims? So today uh, I'm going to give a broad overview of the three workshops, um, of the three parts of the workshop. Um, and then uh, Emma, uh, Simeon and Rashid and Rebecca will take it away the rest of the week. But um, for today, uh, focus on fish contribution to carbon flux. We want to be able to showcase the latest research on fish and fisheries in sinking carbon, um, identifying and prioritizing knowledge and data gaps um, with respect to that specific topic, and discover which academics, policymakers, NGO, and institutes are invested in this. Uh, Wednesday's session, again, focused on carbon impacts on, on carbon sink, fishery impacts on carbon sinks. Um, they're going to be looking for um, trying to identify the knowledge and data gaps that need filling uh, to work with higher trophic levels and biogeochemical models, uh, but also to write in the protection of the carbon sink and fishery policy. And then Thursday's session three, um, the goal of that is really to consider move this board there, consider the numerous stakeholders in fisheries and sinking carbon, identify what the socioeconomic outcomes might be um, for editing fisheries policy um, to include protection and monitoring of the carbon sink. I put the link there to the workshop website. So if you haven't registered for the other two sessions, please do so if you are interested in those components of, of fish, fisheries, and carbon. So the format for each session is, is going to be a set of invited plenary speakers that's going to basically provide the contextual information that's relevant to the central topic of each session. And then there's going to be a set of lightning talks, and those are really to provide the diverse range of research occurring under that broad umbrella. And then we're going to have a short uh, breakout interactive discussions to design the future research and policy directions. And we are really looking forward to hearing your feedback um, on this today and for the sessions on Wednesday and Thursday. That's really how we're gonna be able to tell 
you know, where are we going to go uh, with this information? And in terms of future research, um, how do we how do we progress this forward? So really looking forward to your feedback and interactions in the breakout uh, component of the sessions. So today we're going to have four plenary speakers and then we'll have six flash presenters. Uh, well, we will have a short break before we go into the breakout interactive discussions. There will be some uh, instructions that will help you kind of guide uh, you through the breakout discussions. And then just a quick wrap up uh, before we end the session at two o'clock Eastern time today. The breakout discussion topics we're going to address in each session really, um, but but again, relevant to the three different topics is going to be what are the gaps in the knowledge? How can we prioritize those the research to fill those gaps? Uh, we're looking to identify the tools and data for filling those knowledge gaps. And then how do we link fish carbon research with fish and fisheries management? So those are kind of the four broad uh, topics that we will be discussing in each uh, session. Um, but obviously, there will be some pretty um, specific questions under, under each one. Uh, this discussion points will be captured using um, notes, polls, uh, word cloud generator, and Jamboard. So we have links all set up for that for the breakout group. So that's that's it. That's our broad welcome. We're really happy to have you here. We are going to hear a little bit more from you now um, in a poll. So we'll, basically, where are you joining uh, from today? And then a word cloud generator to share your primary motivation for attending today's session. And it looks like people are taking it. So we want to get a sense of, of what the what the participation is like today. So we're trying to ask you where you're joining us from. And I know the time zones are, I'm, I'm very impressed with, with the representation from all over the world, given the time zones. Um, we've tried to move our time zones around a little bit. Um, Largely, we had to accommodate our our organizers, but we appreciate you you joining us today. So this is a word cloud question. We got it. We we would really like to get a sense from you what motivated you to join today. Um, not just the whole workshop, but today's session in particular. This is great. Look at this. It's like we slowed down. So why don't we get give it back to you, Grace, to move on with our plenary talks. Thank you. Okay. All right. So this is going to be the first of four plenary talks. I wanted to give just kind of a very broad overview of how fish play a role in ocean carbon flux um, to kind of set the stage for the next three plenaries and the flash talks that are going to be coming up right after that. Um, so again, I'm from Rutgers University. I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, the fish carbon working group that came out of uh, OCB program, which I'll talk about uh, during the presentation. But you can see this video. Um, these are Atlantic Menhaden. Um, so it's a coastal um, epipelagic forage fish. Um, you can see how high biomass they are. Um, but now imagine, um, oops, let's see, them, them pooping. There we go. <laughs> So um, this is really where my research started with uh, fish and the role of fish in carbon flux was by accidentally capturing uh, fish fecal pellets in a zooplankton net when I was trying to tow for zooplankton. Um, and I've been kind of progressing through this research ever since and very curious about um, how much um, carbon fish produce and what are the impacts in terms of export flux. Um, and it all comes down to this process called the biological pump, which is um, the process by which net community production from the ocean surface is transferred down into the ocean interior. So this is really where, um, you know, in terms of importance, um, this is in terms of importance of carbon flux, this is the process that we start thinking about. And there's incorporates a lot of different processes, things like aggregate sinking, uh, fecal pellet sinking, uh, vertical migration, so fishes and plankton, many groups undergo a vertical migration from the surface to the mesopelagic. Um, and then there's also physical mixing of dissolved organic matter. 
Um, but this biological pump is responsible for uh, transforming this dissolved um, inorganic carbon, this carbon dioxide, um, into organic biomass through the process of photosynthesis, um, and then through grazing processes, um, and then pumping that into uh, particular dissolved form into the, oops, into the um, ocean's interior. Um, and so the biological pump is a is is where this carbon is basically going out of the atmosphere into organic particulate carbon, and then eventually getting exported down into the deep ocean. And, and you know, not not a lot of carbon uh, gets down there. So you know, there's a you know we have to think about that as well. But in terms of the players uh, of the biological pump, um, zooplankton, um, there's been through a lot of large um, vessel-based surveys and programs over the last few decades, uh, we know that zooplankton, um, so the, emergency, the emerging research demonstrates that fish play a pretty significant role in the carbon export, but, we, but the data are severely lacking. We don't have a lot of data um, to basically reduce any uncertainty of, of kind of what those estimates are. Um, about 10 studies have estimated the active transport in diel vertically migrating fishes, so these mesopelagic fishes that go up to the surface during the uh, nighttime to feed and then go back down during the daytime. Um, they're living mainly in the 400 to 1,000 meters, um, but yes, they're migrating every day, so they're transporting carbon, they're feeding at the surface and transporting carbon through a lot of different processes, fecal pellet production, respiration at depth. Um, and um, yeah, so only 10 studies have estimated, only about 10 studies have estimated the active transport in those fishes. And only about five studies have focused on direct measurements of the passive flux through the production of fecal pellets. So, you know, we, we are really short on data here. Um, but, but the data we do have um, do depict fish being a pretty significant, playing a pretty significant role in, in that carbon export. Um, so in 2018, we started this fish carbon working group through funding from the Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry Program. Um, and the goals of the group, and they're all pictured here, and I'll show their names in just a second. Um, but the goal of the group was to synthesize the existing research on fish carbon flux. So how much data do we have? Um, we also wanted to recognize the challenges in measuring that flux component and discuss approaches to resolving them. Um, there are a lot of challenges and I'll talk about those in a little bit too. And then we wanted to develop research priorities. Um, so what were the research priorities? How could we fill in gaps um, in understanding, uh, better understanding fish carbon flux? And so this work um, culminated in a paper in limnology and oceanography that was published in 2021. And the authors on this paper are the members of the working group. Um, and this paper basically put out um, what we kind of found in these three major goals of the group. Um, and that's ma mainly what I'm going to be presenting um, right now. And so the first thing we did was summarize the fish carbon sources. So what carbon do fish produce and where are they producing it? So this is the kind of um, graphic we put together where, you know, fish are, they're grazing on or they're feeding on zooplankton and sometimes phytoplankton in the surface. They are releasing CO2 through respiration. They are excreting dissolved organic forms of carbon as well as nitrogen and phosphorus. They're producing fecal pellets, so that's that particulate uh, carbon and nitrogen. Um, but they also, through an osmo osmoregulatory process, um, because they're drinking seawater, they have to get rid of the salts. They're also producing these carbonates um, here, so that's the particulate and organic carbon here, these little uh, particulates of, of calcium carbonate. Um, and so they're releasing those as well. Um, some of these fishes, particularly the mesopelagic fishes, are diel vertically migrating, so going, again, going up and down in the water column on a daily cycle, um, and so they can actively transport that carbon out of the surface layer. So um, a lot of different types of carbon fish are producing, um, different pathways, of course, as well for these different types of carbon. 
Um, the other, the next thing we did was we tr we estimated a fish-based contribution to carbon flux, and the way we did that was we reviewed the published studies that reported estimates of passive and active fish carbon flux. Passive being just they're releasing fecal pellets in the surface, and those fecal pellets are sinking out of the surface. And active meaning that's the vertical migration component where they're actively swimming down and releasing carbon at depth. And so we combined um, those uh, published studies to, um, here's, I, well, first there's, there's an example of each one. So the, here's a, an example of the fecal flux. So here was a study done by myself and my PhD advisor, Debbie Steinberg, where we um, measured sinking rates of northern anchovy fecal pellets um, and carbon content. So we could get a carb, an estimated carbon flux there. Um, here's one example of study looking at uh, dial vertical migrating mesopelagic fish. So that that respiratory component where there's the here's the migrant biomass. So there are fish. There's a very high biomass of of mesopelagic fishes that are migrating, and then they have a pretty high contribution of uh, total carbon flux through that respirate, respiratory component. So those are the types of studies that we kind of combined for that. And then the other component for this is the or, uh, particulate inorganic carbon, so that ocean carbonate production. Um, this was a study done by Rod Wilson in 2009. There's been a lot of work done since then. You'll hear more about uh, carbonate production from Mattia Giardi, Giardi today. Um, about that, but just kind of just to summarize, you know, fish are producing these carbonates. It's a high magnesium calcite. Um, they can be soluble, which means that they can um, basically contribute to total alkalinity in the system. Um, they can also sink. They are particles, so they can sink. Um, we don't, we have a good idea yet of what dissolution, dis, uh, dissolution rates are of these particles. So we, it's hard to kind of tell how much of that particle is sinking and how fast it's sinking through the water column. So we, there are still data gaps there, but we do know that fish contribute up to 45% of total surface ocean carbonate production. So a pretty significant amount. So we took all these things into account and, and, basically uh, calculated uh, the mean fish contribution to total carbon flux was about 16.1% globally. Um, it has a very high uncertainty. That's that plus or minus 13%. And that's because of the lack of data um, that we are working with. Um, but still, that's a pretty high percentage and it's relative, uh, it's it's on par with that of zooplankton. Um, so it's it's about equal to that that has been previously estimated for global contributions of zooplankton flux. We applied that percentage mean to modeled estimates of annual global carbon flux out of the euphotic zone, and that uh, ended up being about 1.5 uh, petagrams of carbon per year. So again, on par uh, with that of zooplankton. So okay, so we can talk about export. Um, but we also have to, you know, have some contextualization in order to define, the, you know, the depth that that carbon reaches and the length of time that it, it stays there, right? So we want to know how long that carbon flux can be sequestered from the atmosphere. Um, so we think of that in terms of, um, you know, uh, carbon that's going out of the epipelagic zone, so from zero to anywhere 200 meters. Uh, Carbon that goes past that is, we call that the export depth. So that's carbon that's getting exported out of the surface. It can stay out of there um, for years to tens of years, um, but you know it's it can get remixed um, at some point within that time frame. Um, if carbon reaches um, the base of the mesopelagic, so about a, a thousand meters, we call that the sequestration depth. So that or, or kind of like a permanent thermocline where it's very difficult to get um, carbon to get re remixed up um, or and reintegrated into the upper water column. And so carbon that reaches depths beyond the sequestration depth is there for hundreds to thousands of years. Um, and we call that carbon being sequestered. 
Um, anything reaching the sediment surface is more of a millennium and then burial in the sediments is on a geological time frame. So a much, much longer time frames. But we do need to think about that. Um, the interesting thing with the sequestration depth is, um, I'll go back real quick, is that, you know, these mesopelagic fish are migrating um, to these areas. So they can be a real big, you know, transport, cause, cause a real big transport of that carbon going into that sequestration depth. Um, so uh, John Dunn, um, who was a collaborator on the Fish Carbon Working Group, uh, he ran a ventilation time scale analysis um, from model generated values of annual global carbon flux at different depths. So 100 meters, 400 meters, and 1000 meters to try to estimate how much of that carbon reaches those depths in these global models, and then how long it might stay there. And so uh, carbon flux coming out of at 400 meters of, of, of what's coming out of 100 meters, about 34% reaches 400 meters. And that will stay down about 104 years out of the atmosphere. Um, of the carb carbon flux coming out of the euphotic zone here, about 13% reaches 1,000 meters. And that stays out of the um, atmosphere for uh, the sequestered for at least over 350 years. So, you know, the deeper you go, um, the longer that carbon is sequestered. And, and again, that reiterates the importance of, of these mesopelagic fish that can really actively transport that carbon to deeper depths. So we have a large uncertainty in that measurement. Again, kind of going back to that 13%, plus or minus 13% of our global estimate. And, and that's really due to um, the uncertainty in estimating biomass of fishes, um, they're notoriously difficult to sample. Um, and particularly for the mesopelagic fish, there's an order of magnitude uncertainty in those estimations of biomass. Um, so we have some improvements to do there. Um, sampling the passive flux uh, using traditional methods is really hard. You get the sediment trap here. This fish, are, you know, they're very stochastic in nature and very patchy. Um, so these trap methods are likely missing these uh, fluxes. Um, we're lacking measured rates as well. Um, we don't have rates of fecal pellet production. How, how much fecal pellets are they producing over time? Things like that. Um, and then we have an inability to conduct controlled experiments on deep water fishes. Um, uh, it's very hard to pull a mesopelagic fish up to the surface and run an experiment on it in a lab. So we realize we've, you know, we've been using indirect techniques to estimate rates and how do we improve that as well? Why do we need to do this? Um, it's important in order to be able to improve the parameterization of key processes affecting the biological pump. Um, we need to, it's essential to determine its potential for a food source for benthic organisms. I think that goes without saying. Um, we need more information to develop more accurate regional and global carbon models. And then finally, um, and this kind of goes more into how we're kind of constructing the sessions for uh, Thursday, for Wednesday and Thursday, is to evaluate the potential role of harvesting, so fishing, um, also environmental factors and climate change on fish carbon flux. So how might that flux change in a future ocean where we have fishing and um, climate change. So those are very good reasons for why we are here today. I know that's why I'm here today. So how can you get more involved um, participating in the next two sessions of this workshop, Wednesday and Thursday this week? Um, please join if you are interested in how we're moving forward on this. There's also a few other groups that you could look up and, and join. Jetson, the Joint Exploration of the Twilight Zone Ocean Network. I left their website there. And the UN Ocean Decade is running a fisheries and, and blue food community of practice as well that you could possibly participate in soon. Okay, so thank you. I just wanna thank um, the other members of the Fish Carbon Working Group that worked with me uh, on these, on these um, <laughs> data for the paper that I just presented and the OCB Carbon Program Office. Um, I do wanna quickly introduce Lauren Cook, who's the co-leader for this session. So Lauren is a third year PhD student at Rutgers University. 
Um, they are currently conducting research on coastal forage fish carbon release. So Lauren will be coming up here in a in a second to introduce the three uh, plenary speakers. So thank you very much. Uh, Santiago Hernandez Leon is a biological oceanographer at the Instituto de Oceanografía y Cambio Global, or the IOCAG, in the Canary Islands. He, he obtained his degree in biology in 1980 and received a PhD in oceanography in 1986 from the Universidad de la Laguna in Canary Islands. He is a professor or chair of zoology in the Marine Sciences School at the Universidad de las Palmas de Gran Canaria. He was vice dean of the faculty from 94 to 98 and dean from 2004 to 2005, and at present is the director of the IOCAG. His research interest is related to the effect of climate on the ecology and physiology of plankton communities. He has been working on the role of micro, microplankton, mesoplankton, and micronectin in the ocean carbon flux from the Arctic to Antarctica, but he's especially interested in the assessment of biological carbon pump and how the ocean is exporting and sequestering carbon. He is also inter interested in the study of trophic cascades and how they affect the ocean biogeochemistry. And Santiago, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Hey, thank you. Good evening or good morning or good night, depending on your place. Uh, I'm going to talk about the variability of, um, of uh, carbon uh, flux uh, due to mesopelagic fish. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the export uh, cartoon about the biological pump. So I added in here uh, the, uh, the fish because uh, uh, we uh, in active flux, we uh, put our uh, you know our interest first in the zooplankton, but uh, as uh, we, uh, you know, the uh, the mesopelagic fish and also other uh, members of the uh, of the um, uh, micronecton like uh, uh, decapods or cephalopods are also important. So uh, we have been working here in the Canary Current about the. Uh, uh, the composition of the deep scattering layers and the migrant uh, layers uh, in, uh, at two frequencies, 18 kilohertz and uh, 38 kilohertz. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, we have a, uh, uh, we, we know now the uh, target species in each layers, uh, mainly mixophis and decapods migrating. Uh, to the upper layers and cyclothons uh, as non-migrant layer uh, remaining during the uh, during the night in the deeper waters. So um, we made a, a first experiment in north of the Canary Islands, and uh, we measure the zooplankton and micronecton uh, abundance biomass and uh, also the enzymatic activity of the electron transfer system activity as, um, as a measure of uh, as a proxy of respiration in the deep water. So uh, we can have a first account of the variability of uh, biomass of the different components of the micronecton uh, migrants and also the, the, res the respiration rates. And uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, Grace uh, showed right now. And uh, the, most of the uh, the active flux was due to, or or the largest amount was due to zooplankton, and uh, the migrant biomass was zooplankton and micronecton. And inside micronecton, fish were uh, clearly the majority of the uh, migrant uh, animals there. And uh, talking about the uh, respiratory flux, uh, the zooplankton was higher again because uh, they are small animals with uh, uh, high uh, respiration rates or higher respiration rates. And uh, inside micronecton, uh, fish were the drivers of, um, of the respiratory flux in here in the canary current. So we, we made a, a base, basin scale determination of estimation of uh, active flux by zooplankton and micronecton from the uh, very, very uh, oligotrophic waters of Brazil uh, to the um, equatorial upwelling and the Guinea Dome in here, and also the, uh, um, the uh, oceanic upwelling of Northwest Africa. 
And uh, what we observed, in, it was a, uh, a clear uh, stratification in the oligotrophic area and uh, cold water in the surface uh, in the upwelling area. So uh, the oxygen uh, minimum zone was really high uh, below the uh, Guinea Dome and also in the upwelling area. And here the gradient of productivity we measure uh, all along the cruise from very oligotrophic water with the DCM deep chlorophyll maximums very deep and uh, to the Guinea Dome and the uh, upwelling, oceanic upwelling of Northwest Africa. So we uh, sample with this uh, large net uh, is a mesopelago stroll uh, that is opening 40 square meter uh, in the front. And uh, what we observed uh, was a, a very, uh, very low amount of migrant biomass in the uh, oligotrophic area and uh, uh, of zooplankton. And uh, zooplankton was high in the Guinea Dome and the upwelling uh, uh, of Northwest Africa. But look at the micronecton. Uh, we uh, estimate this. Uh, uh, 50% uh, and 20% uh, capture efficiencies of the troll because we don't know uh, the, the real efficiency. You know, the, the all mainly mesopelagic fish avoid these uh, nets, all the trolls. So uh, look at the 20%, um, the high biomass estimating by 20% of capture efficiencies or by 50% capture efficiency. The, difference is very large. So this is a, a real uh, problem when we study all this pop the population of uh, fish and, uh, and also decapods in, in here. So uh, taking into account the conservative 50% capture efficiency, we observe this. Uh, um, most of the uh, flux was driven by the, uh, um, the gravitational flux, uh, by the passive, uh, passive flux. And, uh, and uh, this by uh, zooplankton and um, uh, micronecton. But uh, in this gradient of productivity, we observe a decrease in the flux of uh, particles and an increase in the uh, flux of uh, the uh, uh, pelagic fauna, zooplankton and uh, micronecton. And also uh, the maximum was in here in the Guinea Dome and also in the welling of Northwest Africa. So uh, when there is a uh, high productivity, we have uh, an important role of zooplankton and micronecton. This is the POC, the particle organic carbon flux, uh, and the slope is uh, really very flat. Uh, and this is mainly because in here there is a lot of zooplankton and zooplankton break the particles and um, this large fast sinking Particles are converted in a small, so sinking uh, detritus. So uh, the uh, when there is a lot of zooplankton, the uh, particle flux is uh, much lower. But the uh, the slope of the active flux in, in relation to primary production is really uh, important. So at a high um, productivity. Uh, there is a uh, much more uh, active flux as we observe it uh, in the in in all the transect so uh, the problem is that we have very few uh, determinations of uh, active flux by zooplankton and micronecton so uh, joint joint uh, zooplankton and micronecton so it's uh, there is still a long way to fill all this um, regression but uh, look at this, uh, another cruise we made uh, during uh, 2018 uh, from uh, the welling area of Northwest Africa to near Iceland. So what we observe in, in, and also in a gradient of uh, productivity to the north uh, was uh, very, very sharp deep scattering layers in the north. So in the, uh, in here in the, subtropical area, uh, we can observe the, deep, the normal deep scattering layer, but uh, they were 
shallower and, and very sharp, indicating that there is a, an impressive amount of uh, animal, mainly fish, migrating here. This is important. Uh, uh, one more time, it is important to know the biomass of these animals. This is the, the real problem we have. So we are uh, relying on the new technologies, uh, acoustics. Uh, this is acoustic zooplankton fish profiler in the rosette for vertical profiles of uh, acoustic uh, data. And also we are developing this video system with red lights uh, in order to, to avoid the escapement of, of the animals. But the problem is that the, uh, um, the uh, mesopelagic fish can see the, the rosette coming in because the rosette promotes bioluminescence. So they avoid the, the, the path of the rosette. So this is a, a, a real problem. We can distinguish a uh, decap or uh, uh, gelatinous plankton, also sometimes uh, some fish, but no, uh, only a few, very few mesopelagic fish in there. So we have a, a um, gelatinous, um, we, we have this uh, profiles by day and by night of gelatinous plankton, and also uh, these profiles of uh, crustacean, um, mainly decapods, but uh, no fish at all. So this is a problem. So we have to uh, try to uh, approach uh, in another way. So in here, we have this uh, micronecton optical profiler system that we are developing uh, here in the Canaries. That is, is this tube with a computer and some cameras in here and here. Uh, so we opted to put the, the, um, the camera at... Uh, uh, 175 meters, more or less, uh, waiting for the animals uh, during the evening as they migrate to, to the upper layers. So with the camera completely, uh, only with a very small movement of the due to waves that we can avoid in the future, we observe uh, this, um, let's see. So uh, now we can see, uh, all these uh, pelagic fish, so we can uh, observe by the first time, you can see there uh, migrating uh, during the evening. Uh, we, we need, to, it's clear that we need uh, better uh, video cameras to, to, to learn about the, the, which animals are uh, we observing, but uh, for the first time we were able to to see the animals migrating uh, to the upper layers. Uh, we expected uh, to see something like a school, but uh, it was uh, uh, two or three fish uh, per minute or or less. So uh, we observed um, for the first time these uh, animals uh, and the swimming behavior of of these animals. Uh, using the a red light and a camera video camera completely uh, stable in uh, in order to do not produce this um, uh, uh, bioluminescence so we can see all the the fish uh, going um, going up in 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 this area and uh, okay we can see some more in here yeah and uh, what we observe uh, is that um, about 20, 20 to 40 minutes or 60 minutes after the sunset, we observe these uh, animals uh, migrating. And before and after that, we could not observe these, these animals. So uh, this is, um, this is a, a, a typical pattern of the DL vertical migration. So we can see in here, okay? So the number of fish observed after sunset increased uh, until uh, 40 minutes after uh, uh, the sunset and thereafter decreased. So this is the, the normal pattern. Uh, there was a, a small trick in here. We put uh, some bait uh, near the camera in order to attract, because we need to to uh, sample these animals and to see and to calibrate the cameras on all this. So now we are working on this because uh, probably 
uh, could be a good method to to uh, count the animals to measure the animals with two uh, cameras and, and in the future if we have a better uh, video cameras we can uh, estimate the, the uh, at least the, the group or if they are um, for instance mix office or something like that so uh, thank you uh, well, uh, in summary, mesopelagic fish have an important role in active flux in the ocean. Other organisms such as decapods are still poorly, poorly evaluated. Uh, biomass estimation is at present the most important problem to assess the active flux. And combining trolls and new image-based technologies are of paramount importance tool for, for this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Santiago. I think we've can have one question while maybe Matias sharing screens. There's one in the chat. Um, there's actually quite a few in the chat, so you might need to answer some of those in the chat, Santiago. But I'll ask this one from Colleen Durkin. Um, why do you think the profiler worked better than the instruments attached to the CTD? Do you think um, sustained observation worked better or does the CTD scare them away? Yeah, the 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 CTD uh, when it's going down, uh, even if it is if it is very, it goes down very slowly. Uh, it promotes uh, bioluminescence, and the, the fish, uh, the mesopelagic fish, can see uh, uh, bioluminescence at uh, 20, 30, or even fifty meters. So uh, they they avoid uh, to be near the the roset. So. Um, uh, this is uh, what we observe, or we did not observe any mesopelagic fish uh, using this uh, this profiler system. So this is uh, this is known. Uh, you know, the the mesopelagic fish can see the uh, the roset coming like a Christmas tree. You know, so with all the lights, so around. So it's uh, it's not uh, it's it's not the the way to to sample these animals. Uh, and uh, so uh, we we are trying another approach uh, uh, such as this uh, vertical migration and, and uh, with a fixed camera in the uh, determined depth. In the future, if we put uh, this uh, video system in gliders, for instance, that they move very 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 slowly, probably we will uh, we will have a better uh, picture of this of the biomass of these animals probably. Thank you. There's a lot more questions for you in the chat, Santiago. So okay, I will go yeah. ahead. All right, Mattia, can you share your screen? And while I while while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and give your introduction. Uh, Mattia Gilardi is a marine ecologist and PhD candidate at the Lipnes Center for Tropical Marine Research, or the ZMT, and University of Bremen in Germany. He has a broad interest in coral reef ecosystem functioning. His current work focuses on the role fishes play in the inorganic carbon cycle. Using coral reefs as a mo as model systems, his research aims to assess the drivers of fish carbonate excretion at multiple scales. And you can go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Loren. So can you see the, the slides? They look great, yeah. Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. Uh, so in this talk, I will present some of the findings of my thesis, which as Loren said, uh, focus on the contribution of fish to the inorganic carbon cycle on coral reefs through the excretion of intestinal carbon. So while many marine organisms precipitate calcium carbonate to form their uh, shells and skeletons, such as corals, mollusks, and others, uh, all marine bony fish precipitate calcium and magnesium carbonates within their intestine as a byproduct of their uh, need to continuously drink seawater to remain hydrated. And this, this process is particularly important for fish survival because it allows water absorption through the intestine. And it also prevents the uh, absorption of calcium into the blood, which uh, reduces the risk of renal stall formation. And uh, the precipitated carbonates are then excreted into seawater at high rates, either alone or embedded within feces. And through this process, they can contribute substantially to uh, inorganic carbon cycle. Uh, 
Rod Wilson and colleagues uh, in 2009 uh, estimated that fish can contribute up to 15% to the global carbonate production in surface oceans. And this uh, estimation was based on the hypothesized link between carbonate excretion rate and metabolic rate. This is because metabolic rate is directly related to fish drinking rate. So the amount of calcium and magnesium that is ingested. And uh, so they used the known relationship between metabolic rate, uh, biomass, body mass and temperature and combined this with estimates of fish biomass at global scale to produce this uh, quantification that fish can contribute up to 15%. And about two weeks ago, we published a paper in Nature Communication where we provide some support for this uh, direct link between carbon excretion rate and metabolic rate. So using tropical reef fishes, we investigated the relationship between carbon excretion and free drivers of metabolic rate, which are body mass, temperature and the, caudal, the aspect ratio of the caudal fin, which is a proxy of the activity level of the fish. And we found that uh, relationship between carbonate excretion and these free variables that, are, um, that correspond to the same relationship between metabolic rate and the same free variable. So supporting this direct link between excretion rate and metabolic rate, and therefore, uh, this is important finding because it supports these previous uh, global scale estimates. But we also found that carbon excretion rate decreases with increasing in the length of the intestine of the fish. And this relationship is actually stronger than that with temperature and the aspect ratio of the, the, aspect ratio of the caudal fin. And this finding is uh, important for two reasons. First, because the length of the intestine is related to the trophic level of the fish. With herbivorous fishes that have typically much longer intestine than uh, fish at higher trophic level. So this means that uh, if we selectively remove uh, fish at high trophic level, we are disproportionately decreasing carbonate excretion. And second, because uh, we show that the, there are other traits that contribute to carbon excretion and not only metabolic rate. And therefore, we need to uh, refine our estimate while including also this additional relationship. And using these findings, we were uh, uh, able to quantify carbonate excretion across tropical reefs, across over 1,400 uh, different reef sites. The map here shows the average estimate uh, carbonate excretion for simplicity. And uh, we found very high variability in uh, carbonate excretion from less than one to over 4,000 micromoles per square meter per day. And this mainly reflects uh, the variability in fish biomass with the highest carbonate excretion being where there is very high uh, productivity such as in the uh, tropical eastern Pacific. Indeed, when, uh, when we apply the causal inference approach, we found a strong uh, relationship between carbonate excretion and fish biome. But we also found that uh, this relationship is actually not proportional because carbonate excretion is increases at a slower rate compared to standing biomes as highlighted by the, uh, the slope that is uh, lower than one. So from a conservation perspective, this means that if we are to enhance this ecosystem function, uh, restoring fish biomass is a key factor, but it's not enough. And we, can, uh, we need also to, for instance, restore large fishes and those at high trophic level, so large predators because they contribute disproportionately to this function. Indeed, we found that the uh, community structure, the fish community structure, in particular, the trophic structure and the site structure are the strongest driver of carbon excretion after biomass. And when we look at which socioeconomic factors uh, influence the carbon excretion on coral reefs, we found a very strong human impact and a um, very weak 
positive effect of management in the form of fishing restrictions or no take areas. And we used human gravity as a proxy for human pressure, which means that uh, reef sites that have low human gravity are those that are isolated. So those that are uh, far from people and the human population density surrounding the sites is very low. While uh, reef sites that have high human gravity are those close to people with a large human population surrounding. So these results suggest that isolation is actually better than current management measures in enhancing uh, carbonate excretion. But while it is important to quantify the total carbonate production by fishes, it's probably even more important to know which types of carbonate are produced by fish, because this determines the, their potential role in the inorganic carbon cycle. So fish mainly excrete uh, carbonate crystals that are typically uh, a few microns inside, and they have typically a very high magnesium content. As Grace said before, uh, that this uh, means that they have a high solubility, and thereby they have been uh, fish uh, have been suggested to contribute uh, to increase in alkalinity in the upper water column, which could potentially uh, contribute to buffer ocean acidification. But uh, we now know that fish produce a variety of carbonate forms which largely differ in their expected solubility from stable low magnesium calcite on the left to highly unstable amorphous carbonate on the right. And uh, the mineralogical composition is indeed particularly important because it determines if and at which depth the, the fish carbonates will dissolve and thereby releasing alkalinity. So this figure shows a um, conceptual model based on data from the Bahamas, which suggests that the majority of the fish carbonates, 57 to 72%, will likely dissolve in the upper water column by increasing alkalinity. But there is also evidence that fish carbonates can be uh, preserved into sediments in shallow coastal environments. And uh, we investigated which factors influence uh, carbon mineralogy uh, at the individual level. And we found that the mineralogical composition determined by temperature, uh, the length of the intestine, and the family of the fish. And using this information, we were able to, uh, to uh, map carbon mineralogy across reefs. Uh, you can see that there is high variability in carbon mineralogy. But uh, the two major carbonate uh, forms produced by fish are uh, high magnesium calcite and amorphous carbonate. This means that there is generally a low preservation potential but high dissolution uh, across reefs. Although in some regions like at higher latitude, for instance, in the um, Western Australia, there is a higher proportion of low magnesium calcite in blue which suggests a potentially slightly higher preservation potential. And we found that the strongest driver of these spatial patterns in carbon mineralogy is actually sea surface temperature. And uh, particularly in warmer waters, there is a higher proportion of the more soluble carbonate so, uh, forms, which are amorphous carbonate and monohydrocalcite and a lower proportion of calcite. And this is important for climate change because with increasing temperature, there will, uh, fish carbonate will be more soluble. So there might be a change in the role of fish carbon. And uh, the spatial patterns are also driven by fish community structure with uh, large predators that mainly uh, excrete high magnesium calcite. So to wrap up, all these uh, results suggest that the role of fish in an organic carbon cycling is much more complex than previously thought, as it varies uh, through space and time 
as a function of fish biomass, uh, fish community structure, temperature, and human pressure. And from a conservation perspective, if we are to enhance this function, then restoring fish biomass is important, but we also need to restore large fishes and predators because they contribute disproportionately. However, current conservation measures are uh, have limited effect, but additional work that we have done uh, suggests that at least for uh, coral reefs, uh, a context-dependent uh, management strategy is needed because it needs to integrate both fisheries management and policies that aim to address socioeconomic, the impact of socioeconomic drivers. And in terms of climate change, we, uh, with increasing uh, temperature, we predict an increase in the carbonate production by fish because of its influence on uh, metabolic rate. However, our results suggest that uh, the carbonate produced by fish will be more soluble. So the, their role can change with increasing temperature. So now it is essential to understand the fate of fish carbonate post-excretion to really uh, understand uh, what is the role of fish in the inorganic carbon cycle. So this is the next important step in uh, this uh, subject. I would just like to thank all the people that helped with the work and the funding agencies that funded my PhD project uh, through the Refutures project. Thank you. Thank you, Mattia. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Jean-Pierre Gattuso who's asking, um, while manufacturing calcium carbonate, fish consume to total alkalinity. What is the balance between consumption and subsequent dissolution? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And there's always a debate because we need also to think that when uh, fish uh, produce carbon, like all calcification process, they consume alkalinity and they release CO2 as well. So actually enhancing ocean acidification. However, it's important to know uh, when and where there is production and dissolution of the carbon, because this may not be the same, uh, the same area. And uh, especially, uh, for instance, it's important for the mesopelagic fish that can pr uh, produce carbon uh, within the intestine at depth and release them uh, near the surface when they're feeding. And in this way, they can increase total alkalinity. But uh, actually the balance from the question, the balance of uh, uh, the consumption and the dissolution is that if all the uh, carbonates will dissolve, there will be actually a net zero F because the same amount that is consumed will be then released. But uh, the, the major limitation that we have is that we still don't know the actual fate of fish carbon. And what we know is just based on uh, the same carbonate forms produced by other biogenic uh, organisms. Great, thank you. All right, um, there is, I think there's another question for you in the chat. So maybe you can answer that through the chat. Okay. Um, Jessica, would you like to share your screen? Jessica, while you're sharing your screen, I can go ahead and give your introduction. Um, okay, thanks. No problem. So Jessica Liu is a research oceanographer at the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, uh, or GFDL. Dr. Liu received her Bachelor's of Arts and Master's of Science from Stanford University in 2007 and her PhD from the University of Miami in Marine Biology and Fisheries in 2015. She completed her postdoctoral training at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, before moving to Princeton, New Jersey in 2019 to join the research staff at GFDL. Dr. Liu works on a range of topics, include mo including modeling global ocean biogeochemical, biogeochemical cycles, uh, plankton trades from in-situ plankton imagery, and modeling upper ocean plankton dynamics in the biological pump. 
Um, right now we can see presenter view, uh, Jessica, so the old swap. There you go. Yep, and you can take it away. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to present. Um, I am here to speak a little bit more about the ocean budget chemical impacts of fast sinking fish detritus. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors on this work that's still in preparation, um, Charlie Stock and John Dunn from GFDL, and then Grace Saba and Lauren Cook from Rutgers. So Grace has set this up quite nicely. Uh, we are, you know, there's a lot of recent evidence from her um, 2021 paper uh, that, that suggests that fish mediated carbon may be a non-negligible component of the biological pump. Um, because fish fecal pellets sink more quickly, this may result in more carbon reaching the deeper depths of, in the ocean, which uh, increases sequestration timescales of this carbon. Um, but fish are not the only organisms that have fast sinking detritus. Um, salps um, notably also have fast sinking detritus and have been studied um, for uh, many decades. Um, but the important uh, thing to note here is that neither of these groups are represented in models. Um, so here we're using uh, the ocean biogeochemical model cobalt, um, which is coupled to um, the GFDL MOM6 ocean model. It resolves elemental cycles of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, iron, and silica, and has this uh, relatively simple representation of the marine food web, um, uh, which includes uh, three zooplankton and three phytoplankton, um, as well as this unresolved higher trophic level um, term. So this uh, term is this a uh, food web closure term and um, these, I'm kind of calling them these fishes, um, consume zooplankton biomass that's not consumed by other zooplankton. Um, so here we can think about it as this uh, represents, this term represents kind of this maximum energy flow from fishes to, uh, to fishes from the plankton. Um, and also here in the kind of standard cobalt model um, published in Stock et al. 2020, the detritus sinks at a constant 100 meters per day and is modulated by, you know, ballasting materials, but is sinks relatively slowly. So a little bit more about this um, higher trophic level loss term. Um, this is, yeah, as I mentioned, is approximation of a maximum potential fluxes of carbon and nutrient to pelagic fishes. So together with the um, benthic carbon fluxes, it has been used to create the statistical model that can reasonably approximate the um, catch data from the Sea Around Us project in large marine ecosystems. These higher trophic level losses uh, seen, hopefully you guys can all see my mouse, um, seen in these arrows here also have been used to force more complicated um, uh, fish models such as Feisty um, from Petrick et al. 2019. So in our study, we were motivated by uh, four main questions. Um, the first is, you know, what are the upper ocean and mesopelagic impacts of fast sinking detritus. How does the magnitude and spatial patterns of the fish detritus compare to those of um, salps and pyrosomes, the pelagic tunicates? Um, what are then the impacts to ocean oxygen um, and nutrients in the water column? And then lastly, uh, are there enough, you know, is there enough oxygen in the deep ocean to sustain uh, the respiration of these fast sinking detritus? So in the original cobalt model, all detritus production uh, flows into one detritus pool that sinks at about 100 meters per day. So for example, this is the spatial distribution of the higher trophic level that kind of fishes detritus production in the, the standard model. So what we did is we split the detritus pool and moved the fast sinking detritus into a separate component, which sinks at 1,000 meters per day. Um, this actually results in a, uh, oops, in a slight decrease um, in, the, in the fish detritus production, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. And then as part of this effort, we were curious about how this fish detritus compares to that of tunicates, um, as seen on this right. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but you can see a recent publication in Progress in Oceanography for more details. 
So um, this is so this is all tunicate detritus, but you know for the tunicate detritus, only a portion of them sink quickly. So you can see that um, when you only consider the fast sinking detritus from these two groups, the values are fairly comparable. Um, with fish having slightly higher values along the coasts, which, which um, makes sense given their overall distributions. So we ran these experiments for 300 years under a forced ocean condition. Um, when you compare the results from the experiments so on the left with a control simulation in the center, the difference between these two simulations show that overall when you include a fast sinking fish detritus um, into the model that actually export from 100 meters decreases almost 7%. Um, looking at the tunicates, if we only had the fast sinking tunicates, then um, this amount is roughly comparable, about 5.6%. And then when you add these two together, the effect is then magnified with an 11% decrease. And this is really notable because um, this, this pattern comes from declines in the nutrients available in the subtropical gyres due to decreased subsurface supply from the gyre edges. Um, so especially when, when folks are starting to think about you know, carbon dioxide removal and increasing the sequestration of um, carbon uh, it, it, in the ocean um, by sending it to depth, then the carbon is all attached to different nutrients. And when we send this carbon down, it also decreases the surface nutrients. So then if we look at the um, at different depths now, um, so the top layer is the sequestration depths at a thousand meters. And then the bottom layers are the flux to the bottom. So um, the story ch changes somewhat. Um, with the fast sinking detritus, fish detritus, this increases um, the sequestration uh, of carbon at a thousand meters as well as the flux to the bottom. Um, so this is kind of similar again to the tunicates. And then when you combine both of them together, this actually uh, results in almost a 40% increase in fluxes um, past a thousand meters and about 11% increase of fluxes to the ocean uh, floor to the bottom. So this includes, you know, both the deep depths as well as the coastal areas um, where uh, depths are, are quite shallow. So in general, uh, fast sinking detritus strips carbon and nutrients from the surface and sends it to depth. So then we were curious about the water column biogeochemical impacts. So here we chose a transect in the Pacific, uh, P18. Um, and so here we're showing the observations from the World Ocean Atlas. Um, on the, towards the left side of the plots, um, this is the Southern Ocean. And then towards the right side of the plots, this is the um, Eastern uh, Tropical Pacific. So what you can see um, starting with this oxygen plot is this um, large OMZ in the red. And associated with this is subsurface elevated nitrate and then a decreased value in this N star term, which is a metric of the excess nitrate over phosphate. And here these negative values indicate water column denitrification. So then compared to the control model with no fast sinking detritus at all, um, you can see that the control model has this um, excessively large um, uh, OMZ, as well as an anomalous nitrate signal, and this also a very large um, uh, overly active denitrification. But interestingly enough, when we add in the fast sinking fish detritus, this actually reduces the biogeochemical biases in the mesopelagic zones. And then similarly, um, this effect is also uh, so, uh, is similar when you add in um, the fish plus the tunicates, but slightly more pronounced. So indeed, when we look at the global metrics of the total volume um, of the ocean that is hypoxic, uh, which we define as the oxygen concentration um, below 60 millimoles per cubic meter, so this top plot, um, as well as the suboxic volume defined as um, oxygen below 5 millimoles per cubic meter, um, with the red dashed line in the observations, 
Um, you can see that um, the simulations that have the fast sinking detritus, so the green, orange, and yellow, and, and the red lines, all have a slower increase in the amount of hypo um, hypoxia and the suboxia that um, is, is shown in the models. Um, this, is, this is kind of a common feature in a lot of ocean biogeochemical models that, uh, and this is, um, I won't get fully into this um, here, but it's largely due to circulation and decreased ventilation from the subsurface. Um, but this has been a, a, an important uh, topic of study for, for many, many years is to how to improve the um, oxygen minimum zones in our models. And so here, these results show that potentially inclusion of a known process, which is this fast sinking detritus from fishes and tunicates may help um, resolve some of these biases. Um, and this occurs because when you send the detritus down to depth quite quickly, this reduces remineralization in the water column, even with a kind of a, an oxygen dependent remineralization effect where um, under low oxygen zones, remineralization is decreased. So even when we include all of these effects altogether, sending detritus down to depth quickly will um, decrease the size of the OMZs. So uh, with all of that, we then ask the question, if so much detritus gets sent to depth, what happens to the bottom oxygen concentrations? Um, so we were fortunate in that there is a very recent data product from Jorgensen et al. 2022 that combined all the benthic oxygen consumption values, mostly around the coast in um, the Northern hemisphere, uh, but also some in the open ocean into a global synthesis. So here, here his, um, is, I'm calling this the Jorgensen observational product. Um, and this is, not, this is not a metric that we compare our global models to. So when we first look at how the control model compares to these um, observations, we can see that uh, in general, cobalt greatly underestimates um, benthic oxygen consumption globally. But then when we add in the increased supply um, from the fast sinking detritus, here I'm showing the fish only, and then the fish plus the tunicates, we're starting to get values, um, particularly in the, um, in the upwelling zones and the extra tropics that start, start to be similar to Jorgensen. Um, we're still not getting these values in the gyres, but we start to see these large scale patterns that look similar to the observational product. So, um, the, so it appears that the benthos can su sustain this degree of supply um, from the pelagic ocean, which is, which is quite good. So I'd like to wrap up and say that, you know, in this study, we, we found that uh, fast sinking detritus strips carbon and nutrients from the surface ocean, sends it to depth, um, and that this, uh, the detritus from the fishes are comparable to that of the tunicates but um, with higher values in the coastal zones. Um, the biogeochemical impacts to the water column are decreased hypoxia and suboxia, as well as decreased water column denitrification. And then we also see an increase in the benthic oxygen consumption, but this is, value is still lower than the observations. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the organizers again, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jessica. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I guess my question, I have a question for you and maybe while um, Heather, I think Heather or May, it's gonna share the, get the lightning talks set up. Um, but like, what's kind of the next step with this? Um, you know, what's the next step in order to kind of resolve this a little more? Yeah, um, I think that it would be really interesting. Um, and hopefully I didn't lose everyone uh, with this talk. Uh, which is shown by the lack of questions, but um, I think it would be really interesting to run um, this model out in um, in both a coupled mode um, to see. Um, so here we just ran for thirty, uh, or sorry, three hundred years, um, and the um, the deep biogeochemical cycles have not um, fully equilibrated. Um, so it would be 
interesting for a couple of things to run this out for a little bit longer for you know maybe a thousand two thousand years to see what the um deep cycles um look like um and then the second would be to run it in um, coupled mode and see uh, what happens in, in the whole Earth system model. Another thing to note is that the declines in export flux from the surface ocean is notable. Um, and so that is also associated with declines in net primary production. When I looked at these numbers, it didn't seem totally out of the range of what we expect primary production, global primary production to be. Um, so if we were to include this in, you know, the X version of the or system model um, that will be contributed to CMIP, um, mm -hmm. we would have to do a little bit of um, adjustments um, to the um, ecosystem and the overall um, contribution from the other sources to export, um, just to make sure that uh, we're not getting overall declines in um, net primary production. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, you got some nice compliments in the chat. And there is a question in there for you now, if you can answer that in the chat, but we have to move on to the lightning talks now. But thank you so much, Jessica. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll answer this into the chat. Great, thank you. Okay, so for the lightning presenters, um, each presenter, we have six lightning talks. They're gonna be three minutes each. We'll see, we can keep on time. Um, and each uh, person is going to give a brief uh, introduction um, during their three minutes. So I'm going to, I think um, for the lightning presenters, um, May is going to advance the slides uh, just so we don't have to switch screens out. Um, so just say next when you need her to do that. Okay, take it away, Lauren Cook. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, so like I said, or like Grace said, my name is Lauren Cook. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Rutgers University and my research interests primarily lie at the intersection of fishery science and biogeochemistry. Go ahead and advance, May. Um, so epipelagic fish, especially forage fishes, forage fishes are less studied than mesopelagic fishes in terms of carbon production and cycling as Grace showed earlier. Um, and it's really important to resolve the carbon production of coastal fishes because these coastal regions are one where most fish biomass resides globally. Uh, two, the coastal regions are at the forefront of uh, biological carbon uptake and very complex carbon transformations. And additionally, forage fishes like Atlantic manhated um, are heavily exploited by fisheries and therefore removed from the carbon cycling system. So I'm using Atlantic manhaden, which is a part of a very large taxonomic group of forage fishes, the clupeids. And go ahead and advance May. They are occupying the east coast, uh, US, the US East Coast and the inner shelf habitat. Um, and go ahead and advance. And so the research aims for the coastal forage fishes um, that I've outlined here are to quantify all the products of uh, their carbon to resolve that carbon production seasonally. And then finally to explore the impacts of climate change on carbon production uh, via ocean warming on uh, the coast. So go ahead and next. So um, advance again, <laughs> sorry. So, um, Basically, I've been bringing manhaden into the lab and conducting these feeding experiments to quantify all of their, um, their carbon production parameters and then scaling that to fish biomass. This is the first step in, in the goals and aims of my research. And then go ahead and next. The, um, then, you know, the, the goal is to take those experiments and conduct them at two different temperatures, ambient seasonal temperatures, and then that elevated kind of climate change scenario temperature. And next. Finally, um, the goal is to take that data and integrate it into a bioenergetics model um, where that relates empirically uh, temperature, food ration, and body size to carbon production, and then allows us to scale up to the population level these carbon production and the relationship between carbon production and all these parameters um, up to the actual population of Atlantic Manhattan as a whole. Um, next slide. And so again, sorry, animation, thank you. Um, so I've been, uh, over the past summer, I've conducted some experiments and have accomplished collecting beagle pellets in the lab, analyze them for carbon and nitrogen content. Um, I've done this at one temperature, but future work, if you wanna advance again, um, it will, go ahead and advance May, um, will involve uh, finalizing some methodology for quantifying carbon production rate, uh, or sorry, carbon dioxide production rate. Um, and then also conducting that, um, 
the, these experiments that I've done in the lab initially at that ambient and then elevated temperature um, scenario and integrating a food ration component to start evaluating the impact of um, food ration on that uh, carbon production. Thank you, that's the end of my talk. Nice job, Lauren. Oop, as the timer went off, you know you hit three minutes right on the dot. <laughs> um, Angela. Yep, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Martin. I'm a PhD student at the University of Agda in the south of Norway, although I'm currently based in England. Uh, my research has focused on the role of fishes in the ocean carbon cycle, starting with a review paper published in 2021. I've also worked on the carbon impacts of hate fisheries from the fish carbon perspective, but considering biomass. And for this session, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the fields and laboratory work I've been doing with my supervisor, Dr. Esben Merlin Olsen, and other colleagues at the Norwegian Institute of Marine Research. Carbon in coastal marine ecosystems has been gaining a lot of attention in relation to climate mitigation actions, and fishes also occupy these ecosystems, but not much is known about how or if fishes contribute to carbon stored in the coastal sediments. So we set out to address just a very small aspect of carbon flux by fishes, which was to measure the carbon content of coastal fish feces. So this research was a bit of a journey in method development, adapting what others have used, seeing if and how that could work for us, coming up with new ideas and trying various ideas that didn't work. Um, and it was important for us to be able to use opportunistic sampling to get material from a variety of species. So uh, second slide, please. Uh, so in the field, we collected material from nine species of coastal fishes, mainly from the south coast of Norway in the Skagerrak, but also a couple of species on the western coast. The species we sampled included wrasses, gobies, gadoids, and mackerel, and the fishes were a mix of adult and juveniles. Some of the species were small enough and hardy enough to retain in the field with minimal equipment, such that the fecal material could be collected directly from the seawater once the fish had defecated and therefore we could also uh, measure the sink rate of that material. And we were able to estimate the carbon content of those fecal samples in milligrams. But most of our samples were collected from live fishes by rubbing the ventral surface of the fish, and uh, mackerel samples were collected after the fish had already been killed. Uh, next slide, please. So in the lab laboratory, we conducted trials with Atlantic cod. <clears throat> we fixed some secondary chambers to holding tanks in which the feces could be collected. And over several days, we fed the cod a diet of two-spot goby and collected the fecal material produced within the following 24 hours. All of the fecal samples from both field and laboratory health fish were analyzed with the CHN analyzer. And unfortunately, I don't have results ready to share, uh, but I'm working on it. So yeah, watch this space. And, and the gaps that we see in this area include seasonal differences, as was mentioned before. So seasonal differences, both in the carbon content and the production rates. And we also need to know more about the fate of the carbon deposited by the coastal fishes, particularly in the areas where there is high carbon sequestration in coastal sediments. Thank you very much for your attention. That was it. Thank you so much, Angela. Oop, there you go. Good job on time too. Um, okay, uh, Lindben, am I saying that correctly? Hello, everyone. Yes, correct. Thank Great. you, Chris. Great. Good Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, Lin Bin Zhou. I'm now working as an associate researcher at the South China Sea Institute of Oceanology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I want to thank Dr. Chris Saba and all organizers to organizing the wonderful workshop and uh, give me the chance to have a Latin talk. I'm interested in how to uh, quantitatively describe fish carbon release and use the lab-based data to estimate carbon release by small fish such as a uh, mesopelagic fish. I want to, I will talk about a new model for describing the carbon released by fish. Next please. A living fish release uh, carbon in moment by moment through Physi physiological activities such as defecation, uh, respiration, and excretion. The release of carbon come from either ingested food in fish gut or fish tissues in fish body. 
the released carbon will, will be in the form of DUC, CO2, and the particular carbon. Traditional uh, fish bioenergetic bio models can describe the allocation of ingested, ingested food carbon, mm -hmm. but it cannot describe the carbon released from fish body. So therefore we proposed a new, new conception model of a fish carbon release that divided fish released carbon into two sources of ingested food and the fish body and the three forms of DUC, CO2 and the particulate, carb particulate carbon. And by leaving the fish, by, by leaving the fish food with radioactive carbon, we quantified the carbon, the allocation of uh, ingest food carbon to assimilation and the food carbon release of as DUC, CO2, and a particular carbon. By feed, uh, by leaving fish body with um, uh, radioactive carbon, we quantified the we quantified the turnover rate or efflux rate of fish body carbon and the allocation of the released body carbon to uh, as the DUC, CO2, and, uh, and the particular carbon. Uh, using the experimental data, we got, next please. Next please. Uh, using the experiment data, we got the, we got a daily, we got daily carbon release model for a model, model uh, fish, marine madaka. And the, and we use using the 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 model fish is the uh, is the model fish is ecologically resemble mesoplaca fish because they have a similar body size and eat uh, zooplankton. So using the model fish parameters act together with uh, literal derived data such as uh, the daily food duration, biomass, and mean body size of mesoplaca fish, we estimated the carbon release of a global mesoplaca fish for the first time. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Limben. Thanks. All right, Constantina. Yes, hello. Constan Constantina, did I say that correctly? Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I come from a different background. So I'm a geologist and a paleontologist, and my interest is in um, understanding how the biological carbon pump and evolved through deep time, and how it may have been affected and affected the um, uh, history of the Earth and uh, geological processes. And um, in that aspect, I'm studying fish otoliths. And we use the uh, fossil record as an archive of paleoenvironmental change and uh, a way to um, find um, uh, to study biotic responses to natural shifts in uh, climate, but also other environmental parameters that go to the long, longer term, much longer than the natural the monitoring uh, attempts that can be can happen today. Next slide, please. And uh, so I use these uh, fish otoliths because they are very well preserved in uh, marine and lake sediments, but mostly I'm talking about marine sediments and easily retrieved and identified to species level. So they're actually the best way to uh, reconstruct uh, past fish faunas and to study uh, uh, fish uh, events, like fish uh, um, um, lifestyle changes, fish uh, trophic, uh, hab trophic uh, habits, uh, fish size, etc. And in this study, what we did is, uh, in order to study the, to look at the biological carbon pump in the past, we were focusing on the mesopelagic fishes, and particularly the aspect of fish size and how this may have changed and in the end affected the, the biological carbon pump. And we looked at it in the Pleistocene, which was a period of change, of uh, significant change, uh, fast change in geological terms of uh, temperatures of up to four degrees change within a few thousand years, which for geological uh, timescales, this is quite rapid. Next slide, please. And what we found is, so we 
um, studied autolysis from specific glycyl and interglycyl intervals that we could uh, pinpoint in the record. And then we used the autolysis size as a measure of fish size and biomass. And we found that uh, there was a reduction of approximately 35% in median body size of mesopelagic fishes during the interglacial, uh, that was four degrees uh, higher in, tem in temperature, in seawater temperature. But this change was at the community level, whereas the individual species uh, show different and often opposing patterns. So over time, we see that uh, climate warming does reduce the fish size, and this should have an impact on uh, carbon export and sequestration. Thank you. Nice job, Constantina. Thank you. Very interesting. All right. Um, I, I want to mention this before, but if you have any questions for any of the flash presenters, please enter those into the chat. Um, Andy. Hi. Hi there. Great. Um, Great to see yeah. you. Great. Um, yeah, my name is Andy Pistler. I'm uh, from the Technical University of uh, Denmark at National Institute of Aquatic Resources. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, vertical migrants and carbon sequestration. Um, basically, we know that about 1,300 uh, petagrams or gigatons of carbon is sequestered in the oceans through the respiration of organic matter. And that's usually what we think of as, uh, the, uh, as the biological pump. Um, and we know also that uh, vertical migrants are extremely important for uh, actually accelerating this, enhancing the, the sequestration, bringing uh, carbon deeper into the ocean as we've uh, seen already today. Uh, so the question is, how much of that 1,300 uh, petagrams is actually due to um, this vertical trophic transfer, vinaigrados ladder, this entire sort of uh, relay of, uh, of organisms migrating vertically all the way from the surface ocean down to the, to the deep ocean? This is a modeling study. Uh, it's, going, it's constrained by uh, biomass observations and uh, ocean oxygen content and is validated against global observations of migrating patterns. So if uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a potted summary of what the model does, right? So uh, first we uh, estimate biomass of all these, uh, of six different taxa of uh, organisms ranging from, uh, from basically copepod-like krill, uh, large pelagic fish, uh, all the way over to mesopelagic fish. And for this, we use uh, cobalt, Cobalt and Feisty, which uh, have been introduced already. Thank you for that, Jessica. Um, and so um, we use that to actually uh, estimate the total biomass in these different taxa uh, on a global level. Um, we then feed that biomass into uh, a game theory model uh, where we try to organize, where we try to establish the Nash equilibrium of the entire uh, vertical migrations of all these different taxa in the, uh, in the ocean. The idea being that uh, they'll sort of like uh, come to some sort of uh, um, uh, stable equilibrium where the, where all sort of like uh, you know um, uh, migrants are, are operating on their at their uh, optimal uh, uh, rate. From that uh, vertical migration, we can uh, produce uh, uh, profiles of dissolved organic, inorganic carbon injection, um, and then run that through a transport matrix model. So a large scale circulation model of the entire global ocean. Uh, we divide the, the production of dissolved inorganic carbon to three sort of like uh, pathways, either direct respiration by the mi vertical migrants, the production of the fecal pellets and deadfall. Uh, and the results are here to the right hand side of this slide. Um, there's a lot of information there as well. And it turns out that about, that about 800 gigatons uh, of that respired carbon in the deep ocean, that sequestered carbon in the deep ocean, actually passes through one or other of these metazoan groups. Uh, the most important ones being uh, copepods, frill-like creatures, and uh, mesopelagic fish. Um, essentially, they, uh, they do so by, uh, by substantially increasing the sequestration uh, uh, timescales of the injected carbon. Uh, to about 250 years. If it wasn't for these vertical migrants, the, the uh, sequestration timescale would be around, 100, around about 130 years. So that's really their, their function. They, they, uh, they inject carbon deeper into the ocean where it stays down longer. And if you're interested, there's a reference there for this paper produced by my, uh, by, by my recent, uh, recently graduated 
um, a PhD uh, student, Jerome Pinty, uh, and that's coming out in uh, in uh, um, yeah in bio, bio in bio, uh, biogeochemical cycles. If I take the next slide, please. So fi finally, uh, I just want to make a few points that relate to this. Uh, firstly, we can think about the entire biomass, the, the biomass of living biota in the, in the oceans, and that's really quite small. Um, and compared to the uh, the amount of carbon that they sequester, um, they, they really have a hugely outsized, uh, outsized role, um, meaning that if we were to fish out certain even small amounts of that metazoan biomass, we could have a huge impact on the net uh, global uh, budgets of carbon, how much carbon is actually sequestered in the deep ocean. So on that point, I would uh, suggest that uh, that fisheries management is uh, is uh, not simply a uh, a process whereby we reallocate uh, fishing quotas, but it's actually a tool that we can use to mitigate climate change. And I think that's something that has already been mentioned uh, in, to, in today's uh, uh, talks. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. All right, our next and last flash presenter is uh, Julian. Yeah, hi, um, I go by Yula Kavarsky. Oh, I'm uh, so sorry, okay. It's okay. Um, so I'm a biological oceanographer, I'm based in Canada. Um, I work for an ASL Environmental Sciences and I'm a PhD candidate at the Center for Fisheries Ecosystem Research at Memorial University, Newfoundland. So as, I wrap, as I'm wrapping up my PhD, I just wanted to share um, two studies that I've been working with um, several colleagues um, regarding mesopelagic fish and potentially their role in the carbon cycling. Um, so I specialize in hydroacoustic data processing. And what we do is we conduct observational surveys using shipborne echo sounders. Um, and what we look at are echograms um, that you see on the top right there. And those represent, um, with some caveats, basically the vertical distribution and migration and biomass of mesopelagic fish and their um, conveners of various zooplankton. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the first study um, that kind of got us thinking about carbon was looking at the um, the geographical distribution, latitudinal distribution of these deep scattering layers of mesopelagic fish. Um, so on the left, you see uh, an echogram across an important latitudinal boundary that's the Arctic Circle where two um, water masses collide, um, where the Labrador Current and the Baffin Bay water um, across the Davis Strait. And what we see is a massive reduction in the acoustic backscatter. Working with a colleague, Thor Clevier, Dave Cote, and my supervisor, Maxime Geoffroy, we were able to find another data set from the Southern Ocean, which showed a very similar pattern. So this was really intriguing to us to ask some questions as to why does this deep scattering layer start to disappear and what does this actually mean for the structuring of the ocean? So we were able to actually compare the loss of this deep scattering layer, the Northern Hemisphere with um, catch data, where we found that this represented a pretty strong boundary between uh, the distribution of mctophids and stomids, gonostomatidae, those are the uh, various lantern fishes um, and bristlemouths um, with the Arctic species, the Arcticods and the Leparidae. So there was both, a, there was a strong biogeographic boundary, but we knew that that wasn't the only story because there are some caveats to using this as a biomass or even a biogeographic uh, proxy. So we started looking actually at lowered acoustic Doppler current profile data, also known as the LADCP. We found that across that same boundary, looking even deeper, um, we saw a, a massive change in the distribution of backscatter, meaning we saw deeper, um, deeper scattering layers, more spread throughout the water column um, in warmer waters. And as we move north, um, those scattering layers started to dissipate vertically. Um, Next slide, please. And so this led to um, another study led by my late colleague, Thor Clevier, um, where we actually decided to dig deeper into that LADCP data and look at global patterns. And so we leveraged these amazing, huge um, global data sets using the 
World Ocean Circulation Experiments from 1991 to 1997, and the Climate Variability Project, um, Clivar Cruises from 2013 and 2014. And my colleague Thor um, brilliantly was able to um, create a relative estimate of backscatter, which really gives us a nice view of the vertical distribution of this kind of fish and metazoan backscatter throughout the world's ocean. So what you see on the left here are the latitudinal patterns in each of these basins along these various transects. And so we decided to compare that to um, vertically generalized production model for um, primary productivity. And we looked at both the net primary production, the variability in primary production, mixed layer depth and the sea surface temperature. And we found actually a really strong correlation between the total deep fraction of that backscatter. So how much of that biomass potentially was down deep into the bathypelagic and the relationship, we found it was pretty strongly tied to the variability in net primary production. And so what our main conclusion from this paper was that the high seasonality that we see in high latitude ecosystems actually leads to this leakiness where food and carbon is actually making it much deeper. And so we think that this low producer, producer to consumer uh, trophic coupling is leading to higher export carbon export flux in the deep ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Ulick. Much appreciated. And thank you to all the flash presenters. That was really great to see that diversity of research going on. Um, again, a, a lot of you have questions in the chat, so please go to the chat to answer the questions related to your flash presentation. Okay, so I am creating breakout rooms now, and we are aiming to have about seven to 10 people per room. So I'm going to go ahead and create those, and they are automatically going to sort you all into groups, into breakout rooms. Um, May is going to drop a link into the chat that tells you where all of the breakout note-taking documents are for session one. And in there, you're going to find um, a bunch of Jamboards. And the Jamboards are just a more fun version of note-taking, more creative version of note-taking than a Google Doc. Um, I'm going to just share my screen briefly, just so you have an idea of what you're getting into. Um, before I do that, I just want to say a few things. Um, after I sort you, you're going to go to the Jamboard. All of them are numbered. So you're going to go to the Jamboard that corresponds to your room number. So if you're in breakout room one, you're going to go to Jamboard one, et cetera. Um, I'm going to ask you on the first page of your Jamboard just to write down the people who attended your great, your, your breakout room and also the name of the rapporteur. I would ask that each of you assign a person who is really in charge of note-taking. That doesn't mean other people can't add notes and comments to the documents, but we really wanna have one person to make sure that all of the points are captured during the discussion. So please make sure that you note on your list of participants who the rapporteur is in case we need to get in touch with them later. Um, you're going to see in the jam boards that we have a lot of these big theme questions that Grace outlined in her intro slides. And then there are some more specific sub questions that you will see in the jam boards. Don't limit yourself to that. Um, however, we do want you to try to spend some time on each, each of these questions. So we've got these four high level questions with a few sub questions. So please try to aim to spend a minimum of 15 minutes, or I guess now that we have less time, a minimum of 10 minutes <laughs> per um, high level question, just to make sure you give each one your attention. You're going to find that some of these are associated with Mentipoles, and you'll see the links right in the Jamboard. So now I'm going to share my screen so you can see what the heck I'm talking about. So you're going to be given this link in the chat that will take you to this folder that's just filled with all of these jam boards. There's one for up to 15 groups. I don't think we'll have 15 groups today, but please just go to the, the one that corresponds with your group number. And then just to give you an idea of what these jam boards look like, you're going to come to the first page. You're going to add who's there and who the repertoire is. And you're going to see actually the first couple of questions are in the form of menti polls. And I want everybody in your group to fill out these menti polls. We're going to be recording the results and that will be part of the sum, uh, summary report out that we do at the end. 
And we'll have these as an archive of your discussions in addition to the detailed Jamboards. So you'll see for these first couple of questions, these are Menti polls that you'll just go to the link and you'll take them and I'll be grabbing the results so that we can share them later. Some of these you're going to have to take some notes and you can add your notes on stickies. I don't know who's used these before, but these are really easy to use. There's a pen here if you want to doodle, there's an eraser, there's um, a sticky note icon over here so you can add a sticky note and write whatever you want on it in any color. You can add shapes, you can add text boxes, whatever you like. Um, you're going to go through question three, which has two parts. And then question four has two parts, and it ends with a, a men, another menti poll. In the case of some of these word clouds um, for the menti polls, we will ask that you refrain from using the words fish, carbon, or fisheries in your responses, just so that we don't have that just dominate dominate the word cloud output. We really want you to get a little more granular in your feedback and your discussions there. Um, so I will stop sharing now. I'm going to create the breakout rooms. Great, right, is everyone back? I believe so. All right, well, the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, we're gonna go ahead and share the results of your hard work. Um, and so uh, we're going to cover a couple of the um, of the things that you guys did in the Menti word cloud and polling uh, activities in Jamboards. Um, you guys' question, um, this first one, the most pronounced gaps in knowledge in our understanding of the fish or the role fish play in carbon export. Um, it's overwhelmingly very much so biomass and biomass estimates was definitely the most uh, answered one um, or the most uh, inputted response. Um, but there are other things, I know it's a little bit small here, um, but there are other things here, things like uh, rates, relating to rates, uh, shelves, geographic variability, um, coastal fishes, um, and mesopelagic fishes, and also stoichiometric relationships, energy budgets. Um, so you guys gave a lot of really great feedback here, um, but it's definitely clear that biomass is one of the most pronounced gaps in our knowledge. Um, Currently, and then if I can move this bar, I could show you guys hide meeting controls. Um, the second question that you answered, where you ranked um, the following research objectives from highest to lowest priority, um, and again that first priority was improving in situ fish biomass and carbon flux estimates uh, was the top priority that you guys identified, um, and then. Uh, empirically deriving those rates um, and then modeling approaches and then the rest uh, followed. Um, but definitely the rates and biomass was one of the key themes there. And finally, um, you guys answer the question, what information do fisheries managers need to begin incorporating this into their decisions? Um, this was way more diverse. Um, there's, you, you guys had, again, biomass was one of the big ones, but um, there's a lot of different ways that this can go into fisheries management, so socioeconomically, um, what species, uh, commercial species, ecosystem services these fish provide, what stakeholders are involved, the effect of harvesting and climate um, mitigation and climate change um, are all things that you guys included. So this is a really, really awesome um, uh, discussion that you guys had. Um, really excited to see these results. That's all I've got. Thanks, Lauren, for wrapping it up real quick. No problem. <laughs> Not much time. And thank you everyone so much for your participation and for sharing your questions, your ideas, and your feedback. Um, tune into the next two sessions that are taking place this Wednesday and Thursday. There'll be a lot more opportunity for you to um, provide your ideas and your questions and your feedback. Um, be sure to register for each of those um, on Zoom using the workshop website. Um, it sh should be in the chat somewhere. Um, but once those sessions have concluded, um, the organizers will put together a workshop summary that will include all the poll results and will also summarize the ideas on the breakout jam boards. Um, these sessions are all being recorded, so the recordings will also be made available. Um, and the word clouds, the jam boards, et cetera, will also be available on the OCB uh, social media. Um, we have one last poll. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> but we have one more. Um, but this one's focused on other potential next steps that's meant to obtain your feedback on how to progress 
the fish fisheries and carbon research forward. Um, keep in mind the outcomes that are listed in the poll, and you'll see that in just a second. Um, they're meant to be cross-cutting between the three sessions, so you'll, um, you'll, I'm sure you'll recognize that right away. Um, and therefore, um, it'll be the same exit poll for each of the three sessions. So if you're going to be joining all three, um, keep that in mind, and I hope that you will be. So thank you again so much. I think the link to the poll is... Yes, it is. Oh, it's going. People are taking it. Excellent. Thank you so much. I should take it too. Let me get on. Please, there. everybody should take it. When you're thinking about these, this is this is something. I mean, these are just an assortment of ideas that we had. So if you have other ideas, please drop them into the chat, and you know, think about how you might champion one of these. This doesn't necessarily. This isn't going to be stuff that just the organizing committee would pursue. We want to build community here. So thank you, Heather. All right. I will stop sharing for now. It looks like we've leveled okay. out at about 35. Great. Thank so you. Thank so you much. everyone. Yeah. Thank you all so much again. And hopefully we'll see all of you or most of you at least on Wednesday with uh, Emma Kavan and uh, Simeon Hill kicking that one off. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for all the speakers. They were excellent. Um, and thank you so much for all the questions and the ideas that you guys shared today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, all right. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, you guys. Bye.